Hi, I'm here with a lecture on the subject of uh, the myth of Prometheus, one of the ancient Greek myths, um, the, uh, the symbol of fire, and the essence of technology. And I hope with this lecture to be able to show how uh, these three themes, these are three different themes in one theme. So it's three in one. And, um, and so I will, I will say a little bit about each of these elements and, um, and hope, to, hope to show how they are, are related in some way, in a way that's uh, maybe analogous to our uh, beloved elephant, um, referring to the parable of the blind man and the elephant. Um, so the idea is these might be different, um, different aspects or different perspectives on a single theme. And once again, that's what I hope that I can show. And so to begin with, I'll, I'll talk about the myth and specifically the, the, this myth of, of Prometheus. And, uh, and I guess, like all of these myths, they kind of uh, interweave and, and form a, a coherent tapestry, but that's almost, um, that's almost infinite. And so it's, it's very, um, in some ways, a sort of abstraction to, to isolate one, uh, you know, one single story from this whole, uh, again, tapestry of, of mythology. But that's what I'm trying to do, and unfortunately, there's maybe no way around that. And so, what I'm going to speak about specifically, in, in reference to Prometheus, is um, the myth of uh, the the uh, the myth in which Prometheus steals fire from the gods and bestows it onto human beings. And so, that's the first thing that I'll talk about is the the myth of Prometheus. And um, the second uh, element of this lecture will be an exploration of the um, of the symbol of fire, the kind of the archetypal fire. Um, which of course uh, is uh, pertinent to the myth because that's exactly what uh, Prometheus steals from the gods and, uh, and confers to human beings. And so the, the second element of the lecture will be, will be um, an exploration of the symbol of fire. And uh, the third element, uh, I hope to connect these, uh, these first two things to, uh, to technology. And um, as I think everyone is aware, that's, uh, you know, that's such a pressing issue of, of our time. Uh, living in in, uh, in this century, and um, and so I, I on the one hand I think um, you know any any amount of understanding or insight into the nature of technology that we can gain, um, it's it's for the good, and um, also the you know it, it's uh, it's so it's especially imperative to uh, to really put forth this kind of um, will to understand or initiative to understand. Um, it's especially imperative because uh, technology in our time, it's like, it's something, I mean, it's almost like the, the sea in which we swim, you know, the, the fish doesn't know the water that it swims in, and sometimes it's hard for us even to recognize the technology that surrounds us. But I hope with this kind of uh, inquiry that, that uh, you know, developing an adequate theory of technology will help us actually to, uh, to recognize it wherever we encounter it. Um, so, uh, as always, that's maybe, uh, you know, it's kind of an ambitious uh, uh, proposition to try to cover all those things in one lecture. It's a, it's a tall order. And, um, and, uh, but as always, I will give it an attempt and I hope to uh, come out the other side. Not the worst for it. And, and again, I don't uh, expect even to be able to exhaust any single one of these themes, let alone uh, the three of these together. Uh, but what I do hope is to, uh, like always, to uh, you know, stimulate further thoughts in anyone who's, who's listening, and um, which of course I invite, uh, I always invite. Um, any kind of uh, uh, reflections or um, always inviting uh, communication and, and, and dialogue on these themes. So, With that, I will uh, uh, then um, set out onto uh, just basically a, a recap of this, um, this myth of Prometheus stealing fire from the gods. And there are a number of different sources for this. Uh, primarily, I'm drawing on uh, one source uh, in Plato's Protagoras Dialogue. Um, and the other source uh, from Hesiod's, uh, well, two of Hesiod's accounts, one in Works and Days and the other in the Theogony. And I kind of, uh, just kind of creating a, a synthesis of all these, uh, these different accounts to try to tell some uh, coherent kind of story. Um, but, but in essence, uh, the, the scene is kind of, uh, it's just after what's called the Theogony, which is, uh, or sometimes called the, um, generally, uh, broadly, the, the broad category is the Theogony. Um, which is kind of generation of gods, uh, is the word in Greek. But actually, uh, I misspoke a little bit. The specific uh, uh, occasion that we're sort of entering in, the, in, in Medias Reis, in the middle of the thing, is just after what's called the Titanomachy. And this was specifically the war uh, between the Titans and the Olympians. And it's a, it's a war of generations, and so it's the fathers against the sons and, and daughters. Um, this, is the, the, um, this is the event in which Zeus, uh, Zeus Jupiter, Zeus being the uh, the Greek name for this uh, you know father father of the gods, um, 
uh, Jupiter being the Roman name. And so these are referring to uh, more or less the same deity. Uh, but this is, this is the occasion in which Zeus Jupiter overthrows uh, his father, uh, his father's generation, the whole generation of, of fathers, and they, these are called the Titans. Uh, the king of the Titans, the, uh, uh, the, the king of the Titans was um, Kronos in Greek, Saturn in, in, uh, in, in Latin. So uh, Saturn Kronos and uh, Jupiter Zeus. Jupiter Zeus is the younger generation. He overthrows his father's generation, um, just as uh, his father's generation had, had overthrown the generation before that. Um, okay, but so, so briefly, they have to kind of reconstitute the world, uh, bring order into this chaos following the Great War. And, um, and so there's you know, a number of tasks to accomplish for the, new, the Olympians, the new regents of, uh, of, you know, of the world. And, uh, and so what Zeus does is he, uh, he delegates some of these various tasks. And one of the tasks that he delegates is, uh, is the creation of human beings. And he specifically delegates that task to uh, uh, one, of the, one of the gods, actually from, the, from the, the generation of the Titans, but one of the Titans who actually sided with the Olympians in this, uh, this epic uh, contest between the generations. And this was, with this was our beloved uh, Prometheus. And so Prometheus is charged by uh, Father Zeus to uh, actually uh, sort of create the human beings, and in fact all the creatures. But um, but uh, Prometheus is, actually has a brother named Epimetheus, and Epimetheus had begged to uh, to be involved in this in this undertaking as well. And so uh, between the two of them, they divided up the work so that actually uh, Prometheus would be would be responsible for creating human beings, and Epimetheus would be responsible for uh, the rest of the creatures and animals. And in fact, uh, the way that it went is, um, is uh, uh, Zeus actually created all the creatures uh, in a kind of prototypical form. He created them out of uh, fire and mud. And, uh, and then it was actually up to the brothers, uh, the brothers Metheus, maybe we could call them, to, uh, to uh, endow these creatures with, um, uh, you know, like um, uh, capacities and, and, um, and, uh, uh, for instance, um, uh, you know, uh, teeth and claws and wings and, and scales and stings and so on. Um, and so in some way like, uh, you know, capacities or, um, or attributes that will enable these creatures to uh, make their way in the world and not merely be, um, for instance, uh, the, the, there's a sort of ordering that's necessary. And for instance, you, you have to have more more zebras than lions, for instance, uh, because the lions eat the zebras, and if there were more lions than zebras, um, the, the, the order would be uh, off, and uh, every, you know, the lions would starve and the zebras would be uh, eliminated. And so the idea is like there's a certain proportion, like you need 10 zebras to every one lion, and so on. This is all uh, tasks that were delegated to Prometheus and Epimetheus. But the brothers came to an agreement, actually, and Prometheus uh, sort of took responsibility specifically for uh, sculpting the form of the human being, while um, Epimetheus uh, was granted this, uh, this uh, basically this big sack of attributes from Zeus that he could uh, confer on the various creatures. Again, uh, thinking of things like, like horns and, and teeth and fangs and, and stings and so on. Um, and Prometheus had the idea that uh, Epimetheus would, uh, would basically distribute these different gifts and then Prometheus would inspect. Um, but in, and in the meantime, Prometheus was going to be uh, elaborating the human, the human form. Uh, so they, they set about their work, and uh, it came, though, that Epimetheus um, had uh, actually uh, emptied his whole sack of attributes and endowments uh, before he... Uh, and so by the time he came to the human being, which uh, Prometheus, Prometheus had been sculpting, um, Epimetheus actually came back with an empty, empty sack, and so there was nothing left for the human being. And um, this is just a brief, a little bit of a brief excursus here. It's maybe in order to talk about the actually the etymology of these two names, Prometheus and Epimetheus. Uh, it's it's common to hear the names translated as um, Prometheus as forethought and Epimetheus as afterthought. And this gives a sort of picture where Prometheus is uh, you know planning ahead to think about how to how to uh, distribute uh, the gifts uh, in a in a in a, in a in a uh, you know a, a, an ordered way, a logical way. Whereas Prometheus, or whereas Epimetheus, his brother, the afterthought, he doesn't think about the problems. Uh, he doesn't think about the issue until after it's uh, too late in some way. Um, I, I think that's uh, that's 
it's not entirely uh, satisfactory translation though because uh, the the Greek prefixes you have on the one hand mites, which refers to some kind something like like reason or prudence more something some ability to balance uh, uh, balance things uh, kind of uh, cognitive um, prudence is probably a good word of course it's often translated as thought the prefixes though are uh, quite a bit more expressive than merely uh, the transition of forethought or afterthought would suggest and really it gives a picture of um, pro being something like uh, with or or uh, to with or to and uh, with the connotation of like being right right there together with uh, kind of in the center of something uh, epi by contrast again it's often translated as after uh, and sometimes it can be translated as both under or over and I think all these things actually uh, fail to uh, grasp the, the real essence of epi, uh, which, which I think can become clear if we think of it in contrast with pro. Pro is like right there with together in the center. Epi is some, somehow uh, peripheral. And so the idea is like Epimethes' name actually refers to something like almost thought or around thought, around judgment, around prudence, whereas Prometheus is like right there together with prudence. And this is, uh, I think it's significant, the fact that Prometheus is in charge, uh, responsible for the human being, and Epimetheus is responsible for all of the other creatures. And it gives us a, a suggestion that the other creatures are kind of uh, on the periphery of, of uh, uh, rational judgment, whereas Prometheus is working with something that's right there together with it. That's at least been a classical, um, a classical uh, distinction uh, between uh, between uh, human beings and the rest of uh, rest of uh, animal nature, the idea is like it's not a it's a it's a difference a, a gradual difference, but animals are missing something um, that the Greeks would have called logos or lo 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 logos, and that's related to um, to the ability to uh, to reason and and speech as well, the idea of kind of uh, the ability to deal with concepts, and not only particulars universal concepts and not only particular instances of those concepts. Um, so returning to the story, uh, Prometheus immediately recognizes what's at stake, and the human being is not going to make it in the world with all these fanged, fanged horned, winged, um, stinged uh, beasts. And so Prometheus resolves to uh, do something for the sake of the human being, and so he's often kind of uh, regarded as a kind of like a heroic figure, almost a self-sacrificial figure, uh, for this reason, that Prometheus resolves to steal fire from the gods. Uh, to give it to the human beings and bestow it onto the human beings. Um, there's an interesting, uh, interesting comment that Plato makes, which is that uh, the reason that Prometheus did not steal uh, something called political wisdom, which would be the, the ability to sort of, uh, for people to be, uh, for people to live in a way that's uh, in accordance with justice and with the good, um, a way to organize people in a, in a harmonious way. Uh, that's, a, that's something, that's a power an ability that was denied to human beings because it, it was uh, the gods actually guarded that too carefully and so it wasn't feasible for Prometheus to steal this kind of uh, political wisdom and so instead uh, instead he made do with fire uh, he stole fire from the temple of uh, of Athena and Hephaestus the goddess the smith and Athena is the goddess of wisdom and uh, it was from their temple that Prometheus stole the fire and he took the fire back down. This was on Mount Olympus. He uh, he scaled the Mount Olympus. He stole the fire and hid it in a hollow fennel stalk. He brought it down to the human beings. Uh, you know, he dashed down the mountain with this, uh, carrying this fennel stalk in his hand, full of fire. And in fact, this is uh, the symbol of uh, Prometheus running with the the fire stalk. It's a uh, it's the symbol for the Olympic torch. And the Olympic torch was just uh, the this uh, procession with the Olympic torch before these, uh, these uh, Olympic Games in the summer in Japan. It was just initiated uh, within a week. Uh, I think last week it was uh, the, this Olympic torch relay began. And, and this is a symbol of this tradition that uh, you know, it traces itself all the way back to this, this ancient myth of Prometheus uh, dashing down the mountain with a, a hollow fennel stalk containing the, uh, the, um, the sacred fire. Um, he gives it to the human beings. Uh, the myth continues, it goes on. Um, in fact, uh, Zeus uh, is uh, furious. Uh, Prometheus is punished, duly punished. He's chained to a mountain in the Caucasus. An eagle uh, eats his liver out every single day. Uh, overnight, it grows back, it regenerates, uh, and he's uh, basically chained in the Caucasus for um, untold eons until finally the hero uh, Hercules uh, comes upon him just by chance and uh, succeeds in uh, actually uh, killing the eagle and ultimately uh, setting Prometheus free. 
Um, in the meantime, human beings are, uh, Zeus retaliates against the human beings too by sending them actually, um, before, before this, the human beings weren't divided into uh, two different genders and he sends them uh, this, uh, this being called Pandora and uh, she has a little box and, uh, and um, she opens the box uh, and, um, and all of the kind of ills and, and sufferings and evils and hardships um, uh, kind of uh, spill out of the box into the world, into, the, into human affairs. And uh, she quickly closes the box. The only thing that's left is, is, uh, is hope. Um, anyway, the myth, uh, as all myths, they sort of, uh, they just, they keep going out again, kind of uh, in, into a, this, uh, well, uh, you know, the myth uh, belongs to a mythology. And the mythology, um, it's really, uh, it's really all encompassing. I'm going to stop there uh, and uh, not really say any more, but just try to um, try to draw a few connections between this myth and other myths before then uh, transitioning to the second uh, primary theme of this lecture, which is an exploration of that symbol of fire. So what was it that Prometheus really stole? Uh, in other words, okay, here's the myth. What is the significance of the myth? What is the, um, the meaning of the myth? Uh, but I do just think it's worth pointing out this idea that a Prometheus has a kind of... Um, a, uh, so on the one hand, he's a, a hero uh, for mankind, for humankind, uh, but on the other hand, he's a sort of like a, an outlaw, a renegade amongst the gods, and uh, you can't help but draw a, a sort of um, connections to other myths. He's almost like a um, well. Uh, there's there's a there's a um, as I as I go through this lecture, I will uh, connect fire to uh, to. Um, try to explore the meaning of fire and then I, I, I think um, I think the, the, the connection to several other myths will uh, become more clear and so um, so it's probably better actually to, to save these uh, comments until until later when they make more sense so um, now transitioning to the idea of fire um, we like so many things especially the most um, maybe in some ways the most important things the most significant things uh, we uh, will be tempted as Plato never uh, tires of reminding us, to um, to uh, sort of uh, um, obviate our uh, possibility of, of of really gaining insight into something by thinking that we already have that insight, and so uh, once again um, we can recall the image of of Plato's parable of the cave, where to begin with we will always assume that what we are perceiving is uh, is the truth. Uh, but in fact, the truth is only something that we win through to, through some kind of assiduous ascent. And, um, and I, I think uh, that, I hope in this lecture to at least, um, uh, in some small way, to accomplish something like that. And in a similar way to, to the prisoner who escapes the cave, and, is, uh, and by doing so, by escaping the cave, uh, the prisoner wins through to some kind of vision, uh, a comprehensive vision, a vision that's, uh, that's much, uh, much wider than the vision that was available to this prisoner at the bottom of the cave. Um, I hope that we can accomplish something similar with, with all of these themes and sort of achieve a kind of a vision of how they, they are related to one another and in fact in some ways expressions of, a, of, of the same uh, essence. And so uh, thinking about the term fire though, once again we are confronted with a term that is so familiar that we might be, uh, we might be tempted to think that there's nothing more to think about with a word like this. It's like, I know what fire is, um, and which we could probably point to uh, examples of fire. People probably think in their minds the image of a, a candle flame maybe comes to mind. And um, I don't mean at all to deny that that's, that's an instance of fire, but, uh, but I uh, also do mean to suggest that there's uh, much more to uh, explore with this uh, concept of fire. So in other words, not only what fire um, looks like in certain instances, but what, but what it is in essence. Uh, what is it that um, what is it that we that allows us to recognize all of the various instances of fire? What do they share? And I'm actually always when I uh, come to the symbol of, of fire, I'm reminded of a a, a, a a quote that I came upon by the German philosopher uh, 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 the German philosopher Hegel, and um, and uh, Jörg Hegel uh, lived in the um, in the kind of uh, earlier part of the 19th century. Uh, this uh, quote I came upon, uh, it says uh, something like, uh, I don't know the, the literal German, but it says something like, fire is, fire is the material of time. 
fire is the material of time. I saw the translation was fire is materialized time. Uh, but I, uh, thinking about it more, and I, uh, I, I fire is uh, the material of time was somehow more, more evocative for me. In, in as I tried to struggle, you know, grapple to try to understand this, uh, this seemingly cryptic or um, uh, enigmatic phrase. And uh, but I think I, I think it's not just um, well, I think there's something to it. And uh, I guess uh, what I mean to suggest actually is is if we really uh, contemplate fire. Uh, the and not only you know sort of the outward appearance of fire, but but what the appearance of fire is really expressing, I think uh, it can become clear to us the way in which um, Hegel's statement that fire is the kind of the material uh, material uh, expression of time. If we think of material as uh, basically whatever is perceptible to our physical senses, um, especially the sight, the you know the, the sense of sight and the uh, sense of touch, for instance. Um, it will be clear that fire, in some way, it's an expression of uh, uh, it's an expression to our senses of this uh, fundamental process of, uh, I guess, um, transformation is probably the best the best equivalence for it. Uh, the the process of change, uh, in some way, that's that's what time is as well. It's uh, it's maybe impossible to think of um, these two things in isolation from one another. On the one hand, time, and on the other hand, change. Uh, we we basically measure time uh, by change, and it's not it's not it's it's really impossible to conceive of change except for uh, except for change that transpires over time through time, and so change and time might actually be two different words or two different faces of the same the same thing, and I think fire uh, is a it's a it, the, the term fire actually refers to this process of of transformation, and we can think of it as both uh, you know transformation can both can be both creative and destructive, and I think we see both of those things with fire. Um, this uh, this will uh, eventually, I'll, uh, if I once we transition to the third theme of this lecture, technology, it will become I think uh, very clear, um, uh, you know, really uh, transparently clear how um, how again fire uh, functions as the um, you know both creative and and destructive transformation. Um, but uh, but but thinking of fire again, we 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 see a sort of uh, concentrated form of fire in a in a candle flame, and literally that's a it's a transformation. Uh, it's a chemical transformation, uh, you know, of, of combustion, oxidation. Something is changing within the chemical elements. Um, but again, I think this uh, the the candle flame. It's it's a it's a concentrated expression of something that's actually um, uh, ha everywhere present. We could think of fire, in fact, as heat, um, warmth, and uh, and and in some way, um, there's no place that fire is uh, altogether absent. Uh, but at the same time, we see different, uh, again, different concentrations or different degrees of this uh, of concentration of this this fire process. Again, the fire process being a process of transformation. And again, I, I suggested a candle flame as a concentrated example. Um, but we can we can find many other examples, and in fact, everything is, is an example of some way. And w what I mean by that is just every every object is really um, it's really the, a process of transformation that has somehow been almost frozen. So it's it's uh, frozen. Uh, it's like a process of transformation that has come to rest in some way. It's like arrested arrested fire process. Um, material objects are uh, arrested fire processes. Or maybe uh, fire processes that, that processes that have been in some way enchanted, momentarily or temporarily enchanted, enchanted into time. Um, and this might sound uh, strange and abstract, but I but I don't think it's abstract at all. I think it's quite uh, concrete. Uh, and and just think, for instance, of, of the way that a a fruit, an apple, ripens on a tree over the summer. Uh, and and this is this is uh, again, it's a kind of a quintessential example of a fire process. The, the, the warmth from the sun is ripening this, this apple. Um, it's kind of cooking the apple. And it's, this is really a, a chemical transformation of that apple substance. So uh, this has to be a fire process. Um, now though, we could go back and think of that, the, 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 whole, the whole organism, the tree from which the apple emerged, the, the blossom, the tree, the, the leaf, and so on. And uh, we can see immediately, uh, immediately perceive the way in which Whatever happens when we set something on fire, so suppose eventually the tree gets old and uh, then we, we chop it up and it becomes firewood. 
this is a concentrated fire process. Something is happening. The chemical elements are changing through oxidation. This fire, you know, the warmth, the fire that's been sort of uh, enchanted into the carbon bonds within the, the wood of the, of, the, um, of, of the apple tree, it's being in some way liberated as light and warmth. Uh, these these uh, qualities that we associate with fire, light and warmth, light and heat, it's being kind of released from a sort of uh, bondage within the, these chemical elements. Um, the reciprocal or inverse process of that is precisely the sort of form building process that is responsible for the, the, the tree as a, as a uh, spatial object in the first place. Uh, this, uh, you know, aggregation or uh, construction of matter, uh, literally photosynthesis, um, which uh, the, uh, the, the Greek words for photosynthesis is uh, directly translated as, um, you know, false is light, it's photo is uh, related to light, and synthesis means to weave. And so uh, the uh, photosynthesis is literally uh, a sort of weaving substance out of light. And this is what the plants are doing. Um, that's kind of the reciprocal or the inverse of the fire process. Um, at the same time, it's, um, it's, it's related to the fire process, but, uh, but just in a kind of, um, you, know, it, you know, it's the ascendant phase of the fire process is one way to look at it. Um, and so, so uh, once again, we see uh, this, you know, the fire process as much more uh, ubiquitous than we might have imagined. And, um, and, but it's a question of uh, attaining an adequate theory to be able to recognize it. There's a great, uh, a, a very powerful quote from one of these ancient philosophers who lived before Plato. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the philosopher Heraclitus, who lived, I believe, in the uh, 6th century BC. Plato lived in the uh, 5th century BC, I believe. Uh, excuse me, 4th century, um, uh, on the cusp of the 5th and 4th century BC. Heraclitus, though, lived uh, you know, a number of generations before Plato. Uh, Heraclitus is uh, thought of as among the first philosophers, the first person to um, first person to use the the term uh, logos in a um, in a uh, really uh, constitutive sense. The idea of like the logos is, it kind of steers all things. The 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 logos there's a kind of order, uh, a kind of order to the cosmos. Um, but this uh, this uh, this extremely powerful quote from from Heraclitus, one among many uh, many powerful quotes from this ancient thinker, he says um, he says uh, this world. He, he describes the whole world, and, and he's famous actually for uh, you know different uh, various pre-Socratic philosophers had posited uh, various sort of like ground substances. A uh, famous philosopher called Thales um, proposed that um, everything kind of uh, everything emerges from water. And you can think of this as the idea of, uh, you know, kind of the way that an embryo forms out of out of fluid. Uh, he had the idea that somehow the, the everything on the earth congeals out of everything solid congeals out of a fluid state. Um, Heraclitus, though, so the various different elements. There's a philosopher who argued for the the primacy of air. There's a philosopher who argued for the primacy of of, of thought. There's a, a uh, Heraclitus is sometimes uh, categorized in a somewhat uh, somewhat. Um, maybe caricature or a superficial way, but he's, he's, he's uh, categorized as the philosopher who, who argues that everything begins with fire. So he's kind of the, the philosopher, the uh, philosopher emblematic of, of this, um, the theme for this lecture, Heraclitus. Uh, he says that this world is an ever-living fire, kindling itself by regular measures and going out by regular measures. The, the idea that the, the whole world is actually a fire. It just, um, there's like, there's various, um, various uh, rates of this fire process and that was what I was the picture I was trying to give between comparing like a candle flame compared to uh, you know a, a, a seemingly solid object which is really just you know a fire process enchanted into into matter um, and uh, and compared to an apple tree uh, an apple itself uh, and so on and um, and so once again the you know fire in some way it's the same thing as time and it's the same thing as transformation and, um, and so I hope that's in some way clear. Um, I, I think uh, starting from that as a kind of departure point, then uh, there are a number of connections to make and, and I won't try to make all of the possible connections, obviously, but one that I think can be quite, uh, quite um, uh, maybe uh, quite fruitful actually is to consider the way in which, um, again, thinking of uh, fire as the processes of transformation, what does it mean then that that Prometheus stole the fire that once belonged to the gods 
and now belongs and now it has conferred it to human beings. So now the human beings have a share in the fire processes. And again, if we think of the you know nature in some way is continually uh, transforming itself and, uh, and from you know changing from one thing to the next, but it does so like Heraclitus suggested uh, by regular measures. This would be you know the word in Greek for this the idea of regular measures. Uh, the, the word in Greek, uh, the word logos, would capture this idea of some kind of some kind of uh, internal order to some to a process, and uh, and you know nature is uh, in some ways when we think of nature we think of just that these kind of processes of change but not arbitrary change change that's ordered in some way just think of the way the season you know the earth uh, landscape changes with the seasons and so on um, and then you know all the way down even even to the 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 relationship like chemical chemical elements the relationship between these things they're continually changing but it, again in a sort of ordered way uh, that provides for um, intelligibility of it in the first place it was totally random uh, and total chaos we wouldn't be able to uh, to, to, to think about it um, and so uh, and so we can pose the question though you know what does it mean not only we have the we were presented with this scene of Prometheus stealing fire but okay, uh, then what does that scene, what is the significance of that scene? And one way to think about this actually is, is, is that uh, human beings have been in some ways, um, if we think of the gods first as these, uh, as the, um, something like the, uh, the, the, the patterns or the, um, the basic st uh, structures of transformation in nature. Uh, today you wouldn't say gods, but you might say something like laws of physics, uh, laws of nature, natural laws. Uh, in the ancient times, uh, the, uh, they wouldn't have used phrases like that. The equivalent phrases would have been, though, the gods. And these are, again, some way, uh, some, you know, more or less um, ordered processes of transformation. Um, so it's, you know, it's uh, obviously, again, nature is dynamic, not stagnant. And there's some, uh, there's some uh, you know, lawful, comparatively lawful uh, manner of structure of transformation is a good way to look at it. But it's a structure, obviously, not in space so much as in time. So it's a structure of transformation through time. The gods, uh, that's what the, god, uh, the gods would have meant, is these uh, ordered structures of transformation through time. And uh, then if we, uh, you know, make this connection, we, we, it's revealed to us, it can kind of uh, disclose to us something um, that's sort of right in front of our noses, so to speak, which is that human beings have been granted the ability to begin to sort of um, tamper with those n uh, natural structures of transformation and, you know, manipulate them and suit them to our convenience. And, um, you know, I don't think it, it uh, doesn't, it, it's, it's kind of a almost uh, a straight, so, so straightforward connection um, that maybe it's maybe possible to even, even not notice it, which is, just the, the, the idea of um, the way in which human activities are beginning to influence the very, um, the very uh, you know, climate and, and temperature on the whole planet. This is in some way a, a literal expression of, of what this myth is actually um, suggesting to us. Uh, it's a way in which human beings um, are, uh, again, are able to, um, to alter and tamper and, and um, manipulate the, the structures of, of, of nature itself. And, um, and and we see that we see that everywhere, um, and that's probably um, that's probably a good a, a good actually a very neat segue in fact into the into the last theme that I was uh, going to attempt to cover in this lecture, um, but I think it's a very natural transition now given the the groundwork of these uh, two uh, first themes first the myth of Prometheus and then the exploration of, of archetypal fire, and that's the theme of technology. And so, in, in some ways, we see technology as uh, it's it's kind of um, it's a uh, almost a symbol of the human being's ability to wield this this uh, archetypal fire or this ability to uh, alter and manipulate and bend the structures of uh, of of natural chains change to bend those structures to our own benefit, our own advantage, and you know even in the most the most material sense, you realize that technology really. Um, uh, in some ways, it, it, it really, uh, I don't want to say that it began, but, it, but certainly uh, uh, had the, the kind of like watershed moment in technology was the, was the beginning of, of fire, the ability to use fire to, to smelt metals and to, to, uh, to, to again, make, you know, fashion um, implements uh, of, of, of agriculture or of imp imp implements of war, whatever it happened to be, you know, out of bronze, iron, 
to be able to wield fire to, uh, again, um, transform these elements of the earth and uh, form, uh, to, to transform them and form them into, uh, in, you know, according to, uh, to uh, ideas in our own in human minds. And this ability to uh, kind of um, uh, imbue the earth with our ideas, with our intelligence. Uh, this is um, this is the quality that, in some ways, Prometheus is the the um, the symbolic uh, bestower of this this ability, this power to human beings. And it's you know uh, the the myth suggests it's a kind of uh, godlike power. In other words, whatever uh, is responsible for creating nature, uh, human beings actually are uh, have at least um, have at least a corner of the same uh, uh, the same power in in our hands. And um, I mean, obviously, uh, this is uh, somewhat of a tangent, but there's uh, uh, obvious, you know, serious and significant uh, moral questions and, and questions of what kind of responsibility that humans bear for that, uh, to wielding that kind of power, which, um, as far as I'm concerned, the, the fact that we wield that power is, is um, kind of incontrovertible. It seems to be just an obvious fact. And the, the question is, you know, what is, a, what is a proper way to relate to that power? And I think that's a discussion that's um, that's ongoing in our uh, present time, uh, for for many different reasons. Um, but I would like to, uh, in a similar way to, to the way in which we uh, tried to, um, you know, not only satisfy or content ourselves with instances of fire, but rather try to uh, uh, try to contemplate fire until we are able to somehow perceive the the essence of fire. Um, uh, try to do something similar with technology. And I suggest that in some way the, the two concepts are at least partly uh, coextensive. Like they're certainly not totally separate. Um, again, the way, uh, you know, in, in some way we, technology is a, one way to think of it is technology is, uh, is, exists as the kind of um, uh, terminum, terminus ad, ad quem of fire processes. It's like whatever, uh, whatever uh, the, the, the fire process, when human beings wield the fire process, the outcome is almost always some kind of uh, some kind of technology, and um, and uh, and the idea of technology, um, I think it will be so. The way that fire uh, it takes a certain how to say this the the way to uh, the, the concentration or like the, the intensity of a fire process um, that uh, the measure of, of of the intensity of fire process is the rate of transformation. So the greater the intensity of the fire process, the greater the rate of transformation. And now if we think about this in terms of technology, it will be clear that uh, it's, that's just what technology, uh, technology accomplishes, is that, uh, for instance, uh, to accomplish any given task, um, technology uh, is created for the sake of, um, of uh, increasing efficiency to accomplish that task. Um, what it's not created for is to, uh, and that's the only thing that it has any say in. It's not, it has, it's not relevant uh, in respect to technology, technology as such, to consider uh, whether the task is a good one in the first place. Uh, but it's rather, it allows us to uh, perform tasks with uh, greater efficiency. Um, it, it doesn't allow us to perform tasks, uh, better tasks in the first place. So it has nothing to do with the uh, kind of like, um, uh, you know, practical wisdom to, uh, or, and, and practical wisdom to discern which task is, uh, is, is worth accomplishing. Instead, technology just expedites whatever, whatever task that it comes in, in touch with. Um, it, you know, just to give a, a, a visual uh, image of this, just imagine whatever is the reach of, uh, the reach of a, a human arm span. If I'm reaching out, uh, I can, uh, whatever is my reach uh, that, that's given, um, it's always going to be longer if I have a stick and so on. And if I have a, um, especially if I have a, a robot or a drone to do my bidding, you just see how technology, whatever is my reach, my physical reach in space, technology magnifies that, it amplifies that. Um, so in some more ways, technology, it's a, it can be seen both as a, a, a kind of a, something that increases a, a, a uh, again, a, a technology, a, a, an artif artifice that increases uh, efficiency, um, and it also uh, increases um, well the reach of human beings. But you can think of reach in a metaphorical sense, like whatever whatever capacities that a human being has, technology will magnify them or augment them. And this is, of course, a theme uh, that relates to another one of Plato's myths that was covered in an earlier lecture, and uh, specifically the myth of Thoth and the the um, the, the art of writing technology of writing 
we saw we we saw you know uh, you know very um, very iconic example of the way in which technology uh, augments and magnifies capacities uh, uh, nascent and, and native capacities to human beings. Technology augments those capacities, uh, but with a certain kind of uh, risk or uh, maybe even a cost. Um, but it, with writing, for example, uh, whatever uh, whatever a person was capable of remembering. Um, writing has uh, has again augmented that uh, that capacity and kind of uh, more than augmenting also outsourcing um, uh, outsourcing the capacity kind of externalizing it onto something other than than uh, the human being and uh, for instance with the reach I, it might come to the point where if I have a robot that can do all of my biddings that I will uh, eventually kind of that ability for me to uh, reach anything will start to atrophy in some ways and so again, this can just serve as a symbol for uh, the continuous, continual risk that technology poses. Um, it's kind of at once, uh, at once augmenting, but at the same time in a kind of surreptitious way, perhaps diminishing. Um, and so, so I suggested technology uh, at once, uh, one element of technology is this, uh, this inc increase in efficiency this amoral increase in efficiency. So there's no uh, element whether it's good or not, it just increases the efficiency. Um, that was one element and I suggested the, the, the way in which we can picture that in space. We can also picture that in time, uh, the way in which it increases efficiency in time. Obviously, if I have to, uh, if I have to, um, uh, uh, for instance, um, uh, drive, uh, if, for instance, if I have to walk to, um, to uh, Texas, for instance, that will take uh, a certain period of time. If I have to ride the bike, uh, the, uh, ride the bicycle, that's a tech technological innovation. It will take a little bit less time, provided I don't, uh, you know, get a flat tire or something. Um, and uh, and then if I can just drive a truck, then that's even faster. And obviously flying an airplane and so on. And we see the way in which uh, not only does technology kind of um, collapse. Uh, or uh, almost telescope space, it telescopes space and collapses space, it does the same thing to time. Um, and so in other words, if we think of the efficiency, it's a way of uh, diminishing the, uh, the, the discrepancy between the beginning of something and the end of it. So you uh, start to do something for, for a goal, and there's a certain distance between those two things, uh, both in space and in time. And technology basically flattens or collapses that distance. Uh, and so in some way you can think of uh, Technology, it kind of, um, it consumes space and time. It's like it gobbles up. Technology uh, it eats, eats up both space and time. And once again, this is, uh, the, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, it's kind of like, uh, it's not a, it's not that the jury's out, it's that um, technology, it's just a thing. And the question is uh, to what, en you know, to what end it's put to use uh, and that whether that end is good or not, that determines whether, um, you know, the technology uh, in turn is good. Um, and so, so I've suggested, I guess, you know, uh, one element of technology, which is this uh, ability to collapse space and time, which is another say, way of saying to uh, increase efficiency, um, to expedite processes. So that's the one side. And then we see immediately the connection to, to fire, uh, which again, fire is specifically that process of change in the first place. And technology, it's a kind of like material way of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, um, increasing that, that rate of change. Um, the other element of technology is the, the, the way in which it, it takes capacities from, from human beings and kind of um, takes nascent capacities in human beings and kind of outsources them and augments them, magnifies them, um, uh, and, and it creates like an external image of some uh, capacity that's kind of like latent in human beings. In some way, this is a way, uh, you know, Prometheus stole fire to give to the human beings in order to compensate for what they were not granted by nature. Again, like claws and, 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 and teeth and, and so on. And in some way, you can see the fire as a way to sort of compensate and, and in some way um, kind of uh, almost make replicas of all these different, uh, these different gifts that the animals were given. Um, just think of the way that, that you can make airplane wings out of, uh, you know, fire and, 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 and aluminum. Uh, you know, technology to make airplane wings and then emulate what was given to the birds by nature um, and so on and so on. And so in some way, the technology actually allows us to, uh, to recover some of what was, um, what the human being is not born with, I guess. Um, and so, uh, 
so uh, and to, so that's just a way of connecting the idea of technology back to the the myth of Prometheus um, and so and then I guess uh, one final element of technology that I would uh, kind of just place before us and this I think um, it's more of a kind of a, 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 an invitation to really um, consider what this might mean uh, and, and, and but I, and I think this will also kind of neatly tie all of the elements of this of this lecture together and, and that's the idea of technology the relationship between uh, between fi uh, technology fire transformation um, and the idea of an external energy source and again that might sound uh, that might sound cryptic but but here's what I have in mind in some way uh, uh, if we talk about concentrations of the fire process, I used a candle as an example, but maybe the most uh, immediate example is metabolism. And uh, we realize that living things in some way are kind of like, uh, um, you know, themselves, living things themselves are loci, you know, focused loci of these, um, of fire processes. Our metabolism is an example of fire process, and, and you can even you know feel this tangibly with a bodily warmth, and uh, and we see this in all living things. And there's nothing unique about this to humans, um, and so uh, and so you might say, well, what's the connection? And and this is the connection. It's that um, it's that human beings are actually able to uh, are, are not limited to this this fire of the internal fire of metabolism. They are actually able to harness uh, external energy sources of fire. Um, the most notorious examples of all the well, wood obviously, and coal, and then of course oil. And these are all uh, again external uh, energy uh, fire, uh, you know, energy sources that other than other than by way of metabolism that human beings have been able to again um, uh, take hold of and forge a fashion to their um, to their benefit in a way that no other animals uh, it's not even conceivable that other animals are making use of of uh, you know these external energy sources like um, like um, energy outside of metabolism again like like oil or, or coal or or wood and um, and so the last thing I guess uh, to as a again a kind of invitation to think through this further just recalling the image of Prometheus stealing fire from Olympus and running down the mountain with his uh, hollow fennel stalk uh, containing the sacred fire and then conferring it to human beings. I think it invites the question of um, where we th where we think the gods are and one sort of uh, you know almost literalistic way of thinking about it is well there must be some there's a mount there's a mountain called Mount Olympus uh, in Greece and so this must be on Mount Olympus but I think that actually um, will probably uh, will probably take us further away from really understanding what's at stake. Uh, so if we flew to Greece, I think we would actually maybe be further away from understanding what's at stake than if we uh, almost turn ourselves around and go in the other direction. Again, I'm picturing this image from Plato's cave where the first the first order is to have a kind of conversion where you cease to face the shadows and start to face the mouth of the cave. Um, we have to wonder uh, what does that suggest the idea that uh, the fire was given to human beings and they they uh, they're able to kind of carry it out into the world this uh, you know the, the the world of nature the physical world um, where was it stolen from in some way it's like it was stolen from uh, fr where do the gods keep it where is Mount Olympus really where are the Olympians really to be found and uh, I think it can become clear the picture that actually the myth leaves us with, which is that it was somehow stolen from from these processes uh, that are actually um, that are actually within our own our own physiology and carried out into the world. And so it's not as though they it's not as though Olympus is somewhere exactly out there, so to speak, as uh, more like it's somewhere. Um, well, not out there, <laughs> not somewhere else. And this is just continuing with a the theme that has been uh, kind of persistent through all these lectures, which is uh, the idea of trying to achieve an adequate method of interpreting these myths. And that has to do with uh, not just taking them as though they're describing, uh, you know, physical series of events. 
Okay, so that's probably a good place to draw this lecture to a close. The last uh, thing that I would like to do is just suggest a number of uh, kind of parallel myths or connect uh, myths that connect to this one. And uh, on the one hand, there's uh, these two brothers, and, and it's impossible not to think of, of the brothers Cain and Abel. And in fact, um, it would be clear that, that Cain would correlate to, uh, to, um, to Prometheus in this case. And Cain is even um, understood to be the, um, well, the, it's, it's only a very few, uh, you know, very short telling of this story in, in, in Genesis. Uh, but but it, it makes it clear that, that Abel is actually uh, kind of like a, uh, Abel is a shepherd and Cain is an agriculturalist. And so it's very clear already that Cain is the wielder of technology in this case between the two brothers. Um, obviously, agriculture demands a higher uh, degree of technology than than um, herding animals. That's almost a nomadic uh, a nomadic profession, whereas agriculture, again, is a, it de depends on technology. And um, and so of course Cain slays Abel, and so in some way uh, it represents you know the um, the succession of this 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 way of technology. Uh, uh, over a way of uh, something more uh, more uh, primal uh, and more natural. So that's one connection that I just wanted to, to bring forward. Um, you know, in some way, this this new this new way uh, over overturns or uh, you know supersedes uh, this uh, older way. Um, and the other uh, the other uh, connection that I just wanted to make, which I didn't really go into the the, the, the element of this myth, which uh, which uh, describes uh, Zeus's um, retribution, but again I suggested that he sends Pandora down, uh, and she kind of uh, she's the one that introduces all of these these evils and ills into 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 human life, and um, and it's uh, it's there's obviously a, a clear connection with with uh, the, uh, the, the story of uh, Adam and Eve in the garden. And of course, it's, it's Eve who, who eats the fruit in the first place. And in some way you might think, well, this is, uh, you know, it's quite um, uh, chauvinistic or something to uh, always, uh, always blame, blame the, the woman for bringing in the evils to the world. But I think, uh, again, that's treating the myths as something they're not. And they're not exactly meant to be treated like uh, some kind of, um, you know, like some kind of historical document and some kind of testimony of, uh, you know, sociological, um, sociological testimony. Uh, I, I just think that's not the right way to, uh, to relate to these myths. Um, instead, again, you know, building off of the idea that Olympus is not somewhere out there exactly in this, in the significant way, in the same way, uh, Cain and Abel, that's not like, uh, a man and a woman, or excuse me, not Cain and Abel, but Adam and Eve. Um, but it's rather uh, we sh I we we should be challenged to try to think of um, uh, you know what element in us what what does Eve represent in us what does Adam represent in us and uh, the, just just to offer like for example what might be a number of uh, of, of uh, directions to explore a question like that um, uh, on the first on the first hand you might think of you know what is the the uh, archetypally feminine element of the psyche. And in what way does of the you know the soul the psyche, and in what way does this archetypally feminine element of the psyche, um, uh, you know, um, lend itself to to uh, some you know the introduction of hardship into the world? Uh, uh, and again, these are just suggestions of, of directions to take this the the kind of way that it would be fruitful to interpret the myth rather than um, seeing it as a kind of uh, um, you know. Uh, defense for um, subjugating women, which I, I, I don't think it is in the first place. And, um, and the second, uh, another example, or just like suggestion for how to interpret it is, is uh, the way it does kind of, um, it does, it, it could, it could serve as a, uh, an example of how, um, how uh, the, the, the tendency to scapegoat and so uh, we notice how um, in the, for example, the garden, the Adam and Eve story in the garden, um, Eve takes the fruit um, and then Yahweh, uh, Jehovah confronts her and she says, well, I didn't, well, well, it wasn't really me. It was the serpent. The serpent, the serpent made me do it. And, um, or actually, forgive me. He first, uh, Jehovah first confronts Adam. This is, I guess, what I had in mind, though, about how it illuminates this, uh, this natural disposition that, that people have to kind of scapegoat or blame the next, uh, the next person. Um, he, uh, Jehovah confronts Adam, and Adam says, uh, it wasn't me, it was, it was Eve, you know, it was the woman. 
And uh, he, so, he, so Jehovah confronts Eve and she says, well, it wasn't me, it was the serpent. Um, and so on, and you can just see how the, the scapegoating goes on down the line until uh, somebody can be, uh, you know, the, the, the blame can finally be, uh, can be pinned on somebody ultimately. Um, and, and so again, I, I don't mean to, this is obviously, I've already gone off into a, a different subjects, but I uh, just wanted to offer those as uh, connections between, to, just to show how the myths, um, they describe uh, apparently different things, but there might be a common essence that they're pointing us to. Um, and then once again, though, that essence, it won't reveal itself immediately. It's, it reveals itself, uh, it's the kind of uh, uh, insight into that essence. It's the result of a process and not uh, the beginning of that process. And so I hope with this, this lecture that we've at least uh, uh, undertaken part of a process like that, and that um, by the end of this lecture that uh, these themes stand in some kind of, um, you know, more expansive and, and more comprehensive vision before us than they might have at the beginning. And so um, that's uh, from uh, that's where I will end this lecture. Uh, but again, as always, not before um, sending my best wishes to anyone who's watching this. And um, and uh, and then uh, farewell until next time. Um, and that's